This is what would happen if you ate fast food every day for five years. Now, I'm not talking about the carbs. I'm not talking about the saturated fat. I'm not even talking about the sodium. I'm talking about one important issue, one sole ingredient, trans fats, which are in pretty much every fast food chain in at least a number or a handful of the foods that are on their menu. I've done other videos that break down exactly what those foods are. But what would happen to your body, to your mind, if you ate fast food, trans fats, every single day for five years? Let's break it down. The first one is, well, you might actually develop some kind of cardiovascular disease. Doesn't sound like a surprise, right? I mean, you're going to fast food. But let's talk specifically what these trans fats are doing. It's really wild. And we really learn that Wow, maybe it's not the carbohydrates. Maybe it's not even the saturated fat. Maybe it's this little sliver of trans fats that we're consuming that our body just doesn't know what to do with. It's something that is artificial in its entirety. You've modified an oil to become a solid. When on earth does that sound like a good idea that's like artificially creating the weather or something like that? It's just wrong. So the New England Journal of Medicine published a paper that took a look at three different diets, or they all ate the same amount of calories, same macronutrient ratio, same amount of carbs, fat, and protein. The only difference between the three is that one had oleic acid, monounsaturated fats, being 10% of the calories. One had even saturated fat as 10% of the calories, and another one had trans polymers, so trans fats as 10% of the calories. Put them on this diet for three weeks. You know what they saw? they saw a decrease in HDL cholesterol by 12% in three weeks. And they saw an increase in LDL by 13.9%. Now, I don't care where you stand in the whole lipid discussion of, okay, well, is LDL really bad, yada, yada, because we don't know particle size of this, so I can't go into detail there. But I can tell you a reduction in HDL is not good. But what else is interesting is that we were looking at equal macronutrients, the only thing that triggered this change, not even saturated fat triggered this change, was trans fats, okay? So here we are bagging only on saturated fat when trans fats really seem to be the scary one. But let's understand mechanisms, and to understand mechanisms, I hate to do this, but we have to look at rodent models because it allows us to break things down a little more. So this study was published in the journal Cardiology, and what it did is it took mice and it knocked out their LDL receptors. That's a fancy scientific terminology, but basically what that means is it took out all other variables. By not having an LDL receptor, they were able to measure specifically what diet and diet only would do to their cardiovascular disease risk and their inflammation. So they gave one group a diet with about a half percent of their calories from cholesterol, another group with the cholesterol plus trans fats, and another group with the cholesterol plus oleic acid, a monounsaturated fat. Well, after eight weeks, they found that there were atherosclerotic lesions in the aortic wall of the trans fat group. There was a little bit in some of the other groups because there's no LDL receptors, but it was huge in the trans fat group. So again, it doesn't matter where you stand with the lipid discussion, we can all agree that having atherosclerotic lesions, building plaque in the aorta is not a good thing. And trans fats did this that fast, that quick, eight weeks. Now, for what it's worth, there was also a 68% increase in LDL. But again, that discussion can be a moot point because you always reach opposition. It can be difficult. But one thing that really stood out really powerfully to me was the huge increase in superoxide dismutase. What that means is that there was a huge effort to try to combat reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress. So one thing we all agree on is that oxidation, oxidative stress, and inflammation is a huge problem when it comes down to cardiovascular disease risk. So yeah, you want to develop that? Okay, fast food every day it is. This next one is really surprising because here we are pointing the finger at sugar all the time. Don't get me wrong, sugar's not good. If you want to develop insulin resistance or diabetes, then eat trans fats because that's what it's really pointing to. Okay, check out this research. So the first one we do look at is a rodent model, but it was published in Frontiers in Immunology and it illustrates a really cool point. What they did is they put mice on a high sugar and high fat diet or equal calorie, high sugar, high trans fat diet. So fats are not created equal. High sugar, high fat versus high trans fat, high sugar. And they did this for about 12 weeks and they did real time PCR testing. And what they saw was that there was a 22 and 44% increase in blood sugar levels in the trans fat group. They didn't even have different amounts of sugar. There was just higher blood sugar when trans fats were ingested. Okay, they also saw an increase in fatty liver. They also saw an increase in visceral fat. 
They also saw an increase in inflammation. And lastly, they saw an increase in the expression of CD36, which is a fatty acid transporter that in this case would help transport fat to the liver to form non-alcoholic statosis, fatty liver. Okay, well, that's rodent models. Let's look at a different kind of study. So this one was done in monkeys. Quite interesting, though. They followed monkeys around for six years. Okay, the only difference between these monkeys' diets is one group had equal amounts monounsaturated fatty acids, one group had equal amounts trans fats. Well, they found some pretty interesting stuff. The trans fat group ended up having significantly more weight gain, but significantly, significantly more in terms of the abdominal weight gain. So they had more visceral fat, more pot belly, more overall abdominal fat. What was scary though, was there was a 75% increase in hyperinsulinemia in the trans fat group. They ate the same amount of sugar, same amount of food. The only thing that was different was the trans fats and they had a higher level of hyperinsulinemia, meaning they were insulin resistant and they were not managing their glucose. And the only thing that was different was a trans fat. And then when you look at the levels of fructose amine, which essentially measures how much glucose has been elevated over the last couple of weeks, 213 millimoles in the trans fat group, 168 millimoles in the regular group. Why is this happening? It's probably a result of visceral fat. Visceral fat forms around the liver and ultimately is liver fat. When you have a fatty liver, this impedes the liver's function and it also impacts the overall pancreatic function to produce insulin. So this fatty tissue disrupts our insulin dynamics and our glucose uptake. And of course, our microbiome has a lot to do with this as well, because once this starts, and once you have a disrupted gut, which trans fats can have an impact there as well, then you have an increase in inflammation, which can also trigger the same kind of problem to occur. So I always say, reduce the trans fat intake, reduce the saturated fat whenever you can, if you're not already reducing it below say 20%, but also try to increase the diversity of the foods that you eat so that your gut microbiome doesn't have as much of an inflammatory effect as well. I also popped a link down below for seed, which is a probiotic that I would recommend if you're trying to sort of change how you're eating. Anytime you have a change in eating habit, I recommend implementing a good probiotic. That link down below will save you 25% off your entire order with seed. So it's a symbiotic, which has a prebiotic and a probiotic in it, which means it's got a uh, pretty cool technology. If you look at the capsule, it has a capsule inside of a capsule. So like two capsules in one. And that is a multi-stage probiotic delivery, which is really, really cool. And it's kind of their unique technology. So I highly, highly recommend you check them out. You really do feel it within the first couple of days, how your gut microbiome is changing. You might even feel a little bloated as your gut is actually changing. So that link is down below to save 25%. Now let's continue on. The next one is you'll probably start feeling achy joints. You might even start feeling some kind of autoimmune issues. You might start feeling overall like you're just getting sick all the time. Your inflammatory levels might just be out of whack. And with this, we look at a study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This took a look at 823 healthy humans, okay? And it found that their trans fat intake was dose dependent correlated with the increase in what is called tumor necrosis factor R1 and tumor necrosis factor R2, two very important inflammatory cytokines. Okay, they were elevated 10 and 12% respectively. So in this case, what that means is you're having a huge bump in inflammatory activity, overactive immune systems. You get a little bit sick, your immune system goes into overdrive. The reason you feel the way you feel when you get sick is not because of the pathogen itself, it's because of your body's ability to attack it. And if it attacks it, too much, you have an overactive inflammatory response, that's what makes you feel really, really bad. Now this inflammation could come once again as a result of this visceral fat formation, as we saw with those monkeys, right? They had more visceral fat form. We know trans fat leads to visceral fat accumulation and visceral fat leaks inflammatory cytokines as is. So you're having more of this problem occur. But anyway, let's talk about our downstairs mix up for just a second. When we start looking at fertility, you might notice inside of five years, your fertility is affected. I'm gonna talk about women and men, so hear me out. This first study was the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition study, it took a look at over 18,500 women. They found for every 2% increase in calories from trans fats, that there was a 73% decrease in fertility. Every 2% increase in calories from trans fat, 73% less fertile. It sounds like a great method of birth control to just make yourself very, very unhealthy. It's pretty wild. Okay, well, that's one thing. Let's take a look at men now. So this study was published in Fertility and Sterility, and it found that when they took a look at men and their trans fat intake, once again, in a dose-dependent fashion, the more trans fats that were consumed, 
the overall less sperm count they had. So they had less ability to be fertile. But when they looked further, they found that this actually increased the amount of trans fats in the sperm itself, making the sperm potentially less effective and less potent. Not only that, this decreased the amount of DHA in the sperm. So you're literally decreasing the effectiveness of your sperm and decreasing sperm count. Now, one thing that you might notice inside of this five-year period is your mood just isn't the same. Okay, you might notice, you know what? Like, is it the fact that I'm inflamed? Is it the fact that I'm overweight? Is it the fact that I'm just eating fast food and I'm lacking nutrients? I'm sure that all adds up. But if we look specifically at the trans fats, it's rather alarming too. This study took a look at 12,000 people over 11 years. And at the beginning, none of these people had depression. By the end of this 11 year study, 657 of these people were clinically depressed. But when they went back and they looked at the data and they looked at food surveys and all of this, they found that, wait a minute, the people that had the depression were the people that ended up eating the most trans fats. There was a direct correlation there. So when they looked at all these people over 11 years, who got depressed? The people that ate more trans fats. Did the trans fats make them depressed? Possibly. Was it the fact that their lifestyle was already stressful and they were depressed so they chose fast food? Was it reverse causation? Who really knows? But when we look at the other data and we understand the inflammatory relationship with trans fats, I can make a wild guess. And then lastly, and this is always difficult to say because you might not notice it now, but your five-year habit of having trans fats and having fast food might impact you 20 years from now as far as the ability for your brain to function and to become, well, develop a neurodegenerative condition. So with this, there's a study in neurology that looked at elatic acid, which is like the level of trans fat in your blood. The study took a look at over 1,600 people and they were ages 60 plus with no history of cognitive issues, no Alzheimer's, no dementia. They followed them around from 2002 to 2012. And in that 10-ish year period, 377 of them developed Alzheimer's or dementia. That doesn't sound like a huge amount, but as a percentage, that's a good chunk of people. Well, guess what? The people that had the highest serum elatic acid were the people that developed neurodegenerative diseases. Those 377 people happened to be the 377 people that had the highest serum elatic acid. Once again, we don't really know the specific reason, but we do know that there are links between inflammation and neurodegenerative conditions. So when you look at the link between depression, inflammation, and now neurodegenerative conditions, I mean, we are calling Alzheimer's and dementia type three diabetes, aren't we? We've already talked about diabetes and how that's affected by trans fats. I think we need to start thinking about what's happening to our brain in the long term when we just enjoy our jack-in-the-box habit, not to throw jack-in-the-box under the bus. But at the end of the day, if we know what happens in our body, we can make the best choices. I'll see you tomorrow.